You know, all of us search for our identity. Who am I? And uh, we struggle in trying to come to a place of, uh, 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 of, you know, describing ourselves. You know, am I a good person? Am I a person who's loved by others, appreciated by others? Uh, do people really care about me? Do people really love me? Do people really accept me? You know, we all struggle with our identity. And uh, all of us are either living from an identity or are living for an identity. You know, if you're living from an identity, then you know who you are and all the decisions you make are based on who you know you are. You know that you are a person of integrity. So, uh, when you have to make choices, when you make decisions, uh, you choose by default or you purpose to choose integrity because you know that's who you are. You established an inner identity. And also, when you're living from an identity, the things that you're aspiring for, whatever you're working towards, the goals, the dreams that you're trying to achieve, you're doing it not because you will form your identity as a result, but the reason you're aspiring for those things, you're pursuing those things, is so that when you get there, you believe that you can give a full expression to who you really are. Are you with me so far? But some of us, instead of living from an identity, we are living for an identity. We think that, you know, one day if I become this great cricketer, or I become this great you know, musician, or I become this great businessman, then one day I will have my identity in that. And so we are trying to create an identity pursuing certain goals. And we may achieve that, we may not achieve that. And all along the process, we are struggling with our own identity. Who am I really? And uh, what we all understand is that what we do in life tends to flow from who we perceive ourselves to be. Our choices, our decisions tends to flow from who we perceive ourselves to be. Now, you perceive yourself to be a person of strength. You're going to fight. You perceive yourself to be a, a, person, a fighter. A ne a, a, a somebody will never quit. It doesn't matter what you face. Your response is going to be, I will fight through it. Why? Because you perceive yourself to be a strong person. Somebody is going to fight through life. So what we do tends to flow out of what we perceive ourselves. And here's the other interesting thing that all of us can relate to. We tend to judge ourselves in the light of what we perceive to be the way somebody else judges us in comparison to themselves. You know, so just imagine the two of us. What I think about myself is so influenced by what I think you think about me. And that's how I think about myself. And many of, very, very often, what I think that you think about me is always in relation to how I am before yourself. So let's say, if I think that you think that I'm a bad person, then I'm going to think of myself as a bad person. Because I think that you think I'm a bad person. And in reality, it might be that you're not even thinking about me. Or maybe you're thinking good about me, whereas I think that you're thinking that I'm a bad person, and so I'm looking at myself bad when really you're looking at me good. But unfortunately, that's how we live. And we tend to form our identity based on such assumptions. 
Psychologists will tell us that there are many, many factors that influence the formation of an identity. That affect identity formation. It could be self, it could be family, it could be cultural, it could be vocational, environmental factors, educational, social, even spiritual things. All these play uh, uh, different roles in, in helping shape and form our identity. And you know, all of us have been through a time of being broken on the inside. Our inner identity has been broken. I mean, almost right from childhood. Your dad says, man, you are a loser. And you wake up late and your mom says, you know, man, you'll never amount to anything if you don't wake up before 6 o'clock. And, and we keep hearing such things. And before we realize it, our inner self, our inner identity has been dismantled has been broken by our, you know, by our parents, by others around us. The words they speak into our lives, they have, uh, they have really deformed our inner identity. And we've all been through it. Sometimes by our, by our own actions. You know, we do wrong things and, and then we, we blame ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves. And, uh, you know, and we are so hard on ourselves. And uh, our inner identity is broken. Sometimes we're just totally confused because of all this. And you know, because of, the, uh, uh, of not having an inner identity that is whole and complete, many of the things that we say and we do and the way we act and react stems because of our inner brokenness. But this morning, I want all of us to understand that because... We are in Christ. Because we all are in Jesus Christ. Something has changed on the inside of us. And if we can understand that God has done something inside to consolidate our inner identity. And if we can live from that, life is going to be very different. Amen. God made to become sin for us so that we should become the righteousness of God in Him or in Christ. Whose righteousness do you have? Try it again. Whose righteousness do you have? God's righteousness. That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So what righteousness do you have? God. You are as righteous as God himself in Christ. He didn't give you a different kind of righteousness. You know, he has the white, pure cotton robe, and he gives you a polyester blend of righteousness. He didn't do that. The same pure righteousness that he has, he has imparted to you. So when he sees you, he sees an equal, the same righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that God has brought us into union with Christ and has made him to be our righteousness. God has made Christ to be our Jesus is my righteousness. You know, we used to sing that old song. I don't know if we still sing it. He is all my righteousness. I stand, I don't, know, I don't know if you know it. You don't know. I stand complete in him and worship him. That's a powerful song to sing. You are declaring that you are the righteousness of God. And so you're free to stand before God and worship him. So the key line that I want to make here is this. I should not have a thought in my mind about me that God will not have in his mind about me. Let's say it together. I should not have a thought in my mind about me that God will not have in his mind about me. So you've got to guard your mind. Don't entertain any thought about you that God will not have about you. And God sees you. He sees you as somebody who is cleansed, who is sanctified, who is justified. Somebody who is in his own image. Somebody who is the righteousness of God. So how dare you think any less of yourself? 
when God says, this is what I think about you. Amen? And then there are many other verses of Scripture. I'm just going to run through it right now that tell us what God thinks about us. We are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says that he has chosen up, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless, covered before him, covered with his love. We are accepted in him. We are holy and blameless before him. So many of us are striving for acceptance before God. Maybe if I pray long enough, maybe if I read enough chapters in the Bible, maybe if I fast long enough, God will accept me. But that's the wrong basis for acceptance. Your acceptance before God is simply because you are in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. And you're covered with His love. When God sees you, He sees you somebody covered in his love who's, who's, there is no condemnation against you Colossians 1 and verse 12 says that God has qualified us for the inheritance of the saints in light God has qualified you to receive everything he's going to give to his people so many of us are trying to qualify tell your neighbor and say I've qualified just boast about it a little bit Tell them I'm already qualified. Why? Because God did it. He says he already qualified you to receive the inheritance that he has for the saints. You're not trying to qualify for what God has for his people. You've already been qualified. What you're doing now is trying to contend for it, to live it out, to experience it here on earth. Because there's a devil that doesn't want you to have it. And there are many other people around you who also may not want you to have it. So that's your contention. It's not contending with God. Because he has already qualified you. Amen? He's qualified us for the inheritance that's in the saints. Romans 8 and verse 1. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So how dare the preacher put condemnation on you? Because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation. Now yes, the Holy Spirit convicts us. That's a different thing. Conviction is to lead us to the, towards God. Condemnation is to drive us away from God. And the Bible says there is no condemnation against you because you are in Christ Jesus. And verse 15 of Romans 8, it says, Therefore, we have received not the spirit, Romans 8, 15, we have received not the spirit of bondage to go into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. We have not received the spirit of bondage or slavery. I like how I think the Good News Bible puts it this way. It says, God does not want us to behave like fearful, cringing slaves. God does not want us to behave like fearful, cringing slaves. He says, no, 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 that's not acceptable. That's not the behavior I want. But I want you to behave like my sons and daughters calling me. Abba, Father. Now, religion tells us exactly the opposite. Religion says when you pray, you must say, Oh, Heavenly Father. I can't imitate this well. I wasn't trained, but let me try. You know, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it says, you know, God, you're so big and I'm so small. I'm unworthy, God. I'm a wiggly worm. God, I'm a sinner. I'm unworthy, God. You know, Religion says that's how you must approach God. But the Bible says God does not want you to behave like fearful, cringing slaves. Because he has given you the spirit of sonship. He wants you to say, Abba, Father. We are boldness in God's presence. Ephesians 3 and verse 12 says, In him we have access with confidence and boldness. We come to God. With boldness and confidence. God sees you as an overcomer. 
Revelation 12, 1, he says that you know, we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the, by the word of our testimony. And God sees you as somebody victorious in life. In Romans 5, 17, it says that those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life. You have received the gift of righteousness and God says you're going to reign. You're a winner. You're an overcomer. Amen. So this is how God sees you. This is God's view of you. Now, I just want to put in a, a little qualify here before we close and, 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 uh, and talk about the application of it. Now, because I am the righteousness of God in Christ, because God has accepted me, it's not a license for me to go and sin. It is, it's exactly the opposite. Because I know uh, who I am, I now live out of that. I know I'm holy. I know I'm righteous. So I choose to live that way. So if you really know who you are in Christ, that you are the righteousness of God, you will choose righteousness even in your living. So this is not really a license to go and live uh, uh, you know, uh, an ungodly life saying, I am the righteous of God. I don't care what happens to, you know, what I do because anyway, I am in Christ. No, 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 no. When you know that you are the righteousness of God, when your inner man is created in the image of God in, in righteousness and holiness, and you live out of that identity, you will choose righteousness. Amen? Now you say, what happens if I sin? You know, what, if, what happens if I do something wrong? Yes, we do something wrong. We may say things, think things, do things that are not acceptable for God. But then the Bible says that, you know, verse John, verse John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, a passage we all know, that if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what if I do something wrong? You confess. And God's faithful to forgive. You know, probably, and this may not be a very good example, but to illustrate this, you know, look at a father and a son relationship. The son is always a son. Now, he may misbehave, he may disobey, he may do some things that are wrong, and uh, that kind of, you know, the dad's angry with him a little bit. But that does not mean he ceases being a son. He's still a son. All he needs to do is say, Dad, I'm sorry about this. Please forgive me. It's over. It's gone. And he continues living as a son. So the same way in our relationship with God, understand that God has brought us into union with Christ and, and uh, 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 has brought us into this place of, of righteousness, of standing, of standing before God without any sense of guilt, any sense of condemnation, any sense of inferiority. God has brought us into that place. Our biggest battle is in the mind. Satan is the accuser of the brethren and he will always remind you of how unworthy you are. You're about to pray and he will remind you, you know, you did this yesterday, you kicked the dog, chased the cat, whatever. And you're about to do something for God and he's going to tell you how unfit you are, how unqualified you are to do this. That's his job. So your biggest battle is in the mind. Where Satan brings his accusations, condemnation, and guilt. But you've got to live out of your identity, knowing who you are. I am qualified for the inheritance of the saints. I can do this. I am the righteousness of God. I can enter into God's presence with boldness and confidence. When those thoughts come, you reject them. And instead, live out of who you really are. Of, of, who you know, of, of what you know, the, the way God perceives you. That God accepts you in Christ. Amen. And you know, just like our fingerprint, our identity in Christ never changes. Whether it's in the morning, whether it's at noon, or whether it's in the evening, your identity doesn't change. You're still who you are in Christ. When you feel like it and we don't feel like it, your identity has not changed. It's just your feelings have changed. 
But who you are in Christ does not change. So when you approach God, you can come without any sense of guilt, any sense of condemnation, any sense of unworthiness, without any feeling of inferiority, because you are in Christ. See, when you live out of your identity in Christ, instead of praying that, oh God, I'm so unworthy, so, so good for nothing kind of prayer, you're going to say, God, I thank you that I am the righteousness of God. God, I thank you. I can come boldly into your presence because the blood has made me clean. It's sanctified me. It's justified me. I thank you, God. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm qualified to, to enjoy the inheritance of the saints in life. You come with that kind of approach. You come boldly to the throne of grace. You celebrate what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want to close with this statement from Neil T. Anderson, who is a, is a great author on, on, on the subject of our identity in Christ, he says this, he says, the more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. The more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will tend to reflect your true identity. You affirm the fact that you are the righteousness of God. You affirm the fact that you accept in the beloved. You affirm the fact that you're qualified for the inheritance of the saints. You affirm it. Say, God, this is what you've done. And the more you'll begin to live out of that true identity that you have in Christ. All that religion has told you that you are so unworthy, God is angry with you. God doesn't like you. God doesn't love you. No, you've got to do all this to qualify for God's love and God's inheritance and all that. All the wrong things that we've been taught and maybe we accepted that. We're going to tear it up this morning. Amen? And all the wrong things people have said to us. We're going to tear it up this morning. And this morning we're going to start thinking about ourselves the way the Bible says God thinks about us. Amen? It's going to be a big shift in our thinking, but you need to make the shift if you're really going to enjoy this life in Christ. To live out of your true identity in Christ. Live from that. You're not trying to achieve that. You're not trying to get to it. Religion says you've got to do all this so that you can have that identity. The Bible says you already have it in Christ. You already have it. That's who you are in Christ. You are the righteousness of God. So why don't you take a moment right now to pray and then we're going to tear this up. I want you to just pray and say, God, this morning, I am discarding. I am dismantling. I am tearing down the wrong pictures I had about me. Especially in my relationship with you, God. People told me that I'm an unworthy sinner, but your word says I am cleansed. I am sanctified. I am justified. All the condemnation, the guilt of the wrong that I've done over the years and that I've been carrying, Lord. I don't have to walk under that anymore. Because there is now no condemnation to anyone who is in Christ. So why do I have to walk around with guilt and shame and condemnation over my life when I have become the righteousness of God? So this morning, I am dismantling everything. I'm discarding all the guilt, the shame, the negatives of the past. And I'm embracing this new identity that I do have in Christ Jesus. Let's say this together in Jesus' name. I declare that I am in Christ. I'm a new creation. The old has gone. I am a new person. And in Christ, I am the righteousness of God. I am in the image of God. I am accepted in God. I am qualified in God. I am cleansed. I am just as if I never sinned. 
There is no condemnation against me. I have boldness to enter in the, into the most holy place. I am a son and a daughter of God. In Jesus' name, I discard all feelings of guilt, condemnation, unworthiness, and shame. God does not want me to carry these. I am a child of God. I walk in righteousness. In Jesus' name. I tear all wrong ideas. I tear them down. In Jesus' name. In, we embrace our new identity in Christ. We accept the fact that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come to your God without any sense of condemnation or guilt or inferiority or unworthiness. We come because we are in Christ Jesus. And that identity does not change. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this program. If this program has blessed you, we would like to hear from you. You can call us at 080-2353-9731 or 2354 extension 35. You can also email us at contact at apcwo.org. Please include your prayer requests and comments when you write.